Welcome to the Ortega Path to Enlightenment. My name is George Ortega, and we are recording on May 16th, 2017. This is episode number six, Enlightenment and Love. Okay, a lot of people say, you know, you can't really define love. You know, just like sometimes they say you can't define happiness. You, know, you can define love and happiness. I mean, it, just, it has different meanings in different contexts but it, it certainly is definable. Uh, it isn't like, as a lot of things in this world, it isn't completely understandable, but that doesn't mean we can't understand it and know what it is. Um, and, it, and you know, love is very important to enlightenment. I mean, like, basically, well, I'll get into this a, a little further in the show, but like, you know, it's the idea that, that love is a very powerful, it's probably our, our, our highest feeling, our, 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 our most valued feeling. And so, like, in, in order to be enlightened, um, you know, um, one one would need one needs to cultivate this feeling. And it's not just like a personal feeling toward you know those in our life, but it's also a more altruistic love, like the uh, the Greeks understood this this concept of agape, um, you know, love that that just you know you feel toward toward all, all sentient beings, not even just um, human beings. All right, so so what is love? Love is most primarily a feeling because, you know, like, like happiness, sadness, anger, you know, um, fear, we, we feel it viscerally. Um, they've actually done a, um, an experiment and generally when people feel love, you know, they feel it generally in their, their chest area, their upper, upper abdomen, abdomen, <laughs> whatever. And, um, and it's, so it's a feeling, but it's more than just a feeling, all right, because then like, you know, to to feel love, to express love, it's got to be an attitude. It's got to be something that, that, it's a lens by which you see the world. It's a perspective that you have toward the world. Um, so what is love? It's also kind of like a set of behaviors. It's how you interact, relate to the world. And I think, you know, it's also like, it's a sense of connection. When, when, when we love, when we feel love towards something, whether it's like, sometimes we can love a car, sometimes we can love, you know, it, it's not just related to, to human beings, you know, and, and pets and stuff. It's like, we can love a lot of things. Um, we can love music. So it's just this, this feeling of maybe unity, connection with, you know, whatever um, we're feeling love toward. Okay, but relative to like, you know, other human beings and, and to ourselves. I think that the, the most practical definition of, of love is that it, love is, um, it's about making others and making oneself happier. You know, because like, you know, as we've explored in previous episodes, happiness is really the only thing we want. Happiness is a very important component to enlightenment and anything else, as Aristotle understood and said, everything else is a means. Happiness is the only end in life. So, so basically, happiness has this primal importance. And to love someone is really to help that person become happier. You love a pet, you love the pet, you, you help the pet become happier. You love yourself, you help yourself become happier. And it makes a lot of sense because, like, for example, let's say you um, wanted to help someone in your life. And let's say you gave them everything that they could ever want, you know, all the, all, everything, friends, um, fame, power, money, whatever they may want, they have it, right? But let's say, you know, among these gifts wasn't happiness, you know, fine, you, you may feel like you're loving them, but I'm not sure it'd be such a um, significant love because like the only thing they really want is happiness. In other words, if you were if you were to like provide them with help in being happy and feeling happy, and not give them anything but that, you know, you'll actually have given them more than to bestow a lot of things that that don't necessarily um, create happiness. All right. <coughs> um, like happiness, also love is a skill. I mean, like in order to be happy, you pretty much to a great extent it helps to know how to be happy. I mean, there have been books written and, and a lot of research done, you know, that, that show that 
we human beings are not very good at predicting what's going to make us happy, you know, and um, and so like we we go about it in ways that are counterproductive, that that don't work, that just you know that lead to disappointment. So like with love, I think it's a similar kind of thing. I think that in order to love others, for example, effectively, I think you have to understand others. You know, that love is a skill. You have to not only understand what drives others, you know, be able to empathize with them. You also have to kind of like have an understanding of the human condition. What, who are we as human beings? What, what drives us? Um, and then like, you know, for, for people in specific, you know, it, it's, it's about also knowing them, you know, again, um, being loving toward one person in one way may not be loving toward a person in another way. I'm thinking of like, you know, we guys, you know, when we're presented with a problem, let's say one of our guy friends comes with, with, to us with a problem, we'll like start offering suggestions, you know, like how to fix it and all. And, you know, that's how we think. Uh, when, when we're like, when a, a woman, you know, and I, I don't want to like generalize completely, but like, you know, in, in general, um, a woman presents a, a man with a problem, and basically most, many women just want to be listened to. You know, they don't want a guy or another person to fix their problem. So that's just one example of many that like, we have to not just know, you know, a lot about human nature, who we are in order to love effectively, but we also have to know the person we're, we're dealing with. Some, you know, some women, for example, may not be, um, may not want to be heard, may want a, you know, uh, <laughs> a solution. All right, so it needs to be, love needs to be cultivated, it needs to be practiced, and it'd be good to talk about it. I mean, love is sometimes like happiness. Um, people don't talk about happiness because like happiness to, to a lot of people seems kind of like trite. It seems like, you know, it doesn't have uh, much, uh, much clout. And, and love, I think, you know, I think love makes people feel uncomfortable, you know, partly because, like, there's so many different meanings of love. You know, you have this, like, mushy kind of, like, you know, sentimental love, like, these, you know, you see in these tearjerker movies, these, like, you know, romantic flicks and stuff. And then you also have, you know, love as in making love, you know, and, like, you know, love meaning sex. And so, um, you know, I think both of these different kinds of meanings, which are, you know, perhaps somewhat similar to, but, you know, in certain ways differ from the kind of love we're exploring here. You know, I think that may be part of the reason people are uncomfortable sometimes talking about love. And I think because it is such a strong feeling, you know, like, you know, people like talk about love and they might like, you know, think about their parents who have deceased who they loved really much, or they, they may think about like, you know, uh, a lost love or somebody that, that they love in their present life who isn't loving them back with them. And it's, it's such a, a powerful emotion, you know, um, and that actually explains why some, you know, why our divorce rate here in the United States is about 50% for, for first marriages. Um, you know, to, 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 to successfully, and I'm not, I'm not a good example. I've never been married, so you know this is this is hearsay. I, this kind of like it kind of like makes sense that um, that basically to succeed in a marriage, you know, you've got to know, you know. I mean, to a great extent, it's luck. You got to like be lucky that that you have the, the chemistry with the person that one of you doesn't change, you know, from the way they um, you were, you know, before you got married and stuff. But to, to a great extent, it's, it's like some people, I think, have these skills. They know how to listen. They know how to empathize. They know how to compromise. They know how to communicate. You know, they know how to share their feelings. They know how to, like, argue and, and forgive and all. So these are, like, the, the, the qualities of love that, that need to be cultivated, need to be practiced, and, and naturally need to be talked about. All right. So, um, again, happiness. All right. In, in other episodes, previous episodes, we've um, explored how, like, you know, a very important element of enlightenment is that happiness is the highest good. This is like what Aristotle said, and it makes a lot of sense. Aristotle had a somewhat different definition of happiness. Um, he didn't, he, he, for example, he didn't believe that animals could be happy or young children. Again, it's not the, the conventional definition of happiness. He also tied it with goodness. And he also said that, like, you really can't know whether you're happy or not until you're, like, about to die or something, you know, as if it's a cumulative thing. No, you, you know, our, our current understanding of happiness is, like, it's for the moment. And, yes, animals and children can be happy and wouldn't have to wait until, 
you know, our, our life is over to know whether we're happy or not. But, but basically, we got this right that happiness is um, our highest good. Uh, what is goodness? John Locke defined goodness as that which creates happiness. So, all right, so like if we start with this idea that happiness is the highest good, it's the only end in life, it's all we ever want, then I think it makes sense to also conclude that love is the highest happiness. You know, if, 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 if happiness is important to enlightenment and love is important to happiness, there are so many different ways to be happy. Some ways kind of like neither help others nor hurt them. Some ways hurt others, at, you know, some, some ways hurt oneself. And so like there, there are more moral and less moral ways to be happy. There are, you know, there, there's ways of, you know, ways to be happy differ in, their, in terms of their meaning and value. And I think, you know, it probably makes sense a lot of sense that that deriving one's happiness through love through other people or at least sharing it with other people you know having having a, a, a happiness <laughs> that is dependent or that is founded on loving other people and animals you know you can't forget you know the animals I mean <laughs> we live in a world where we um, treat animals extremely cruelty cru cruelly and um, <laughs> actually um, we're gonna we're gonna do a show on this. Um, Keith Baker, who who um, who's my director for many of these shows, you know, he, he's uh, I think he's behind the um, in the director's booth right now. Uh, he and I are gonna do a, a, a series on this, and it's important because I mean, like you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, animals don't feel pain. No, yes, animals animals feel a lot of pain. Anybody who who owns a cat or a dog or even a bird knows this, you know. And so, like you know, you have about over 60 billion farm animals being tortured each year on these factory farms. So it's really important to, to not just love human beings, but love animals. And I just I was reading just uh, last night, the night before, um, actually how this, this cruelty may end relatively soon, that they're experimenting with, um, with being able to, to grow uh, meat in labs without having to grow an actual animal and slaughter them and torture them, and, you know, with the, with the kind of life they lead. Um, so initially, a while back when they um, first, you know, developed this technique, it would cost like, you know, um, God, hundreds of thousands of dollars for a pound of uh, meat. Now they've gotten that, that down to about eight dollars for a pound of meat. You know, they can like, you know, uh, create it um, to cost that much. And, and within five years, it, it should be down competitive with, with chicken and beef that you find at the supermarket. So between, again, between five and 10 years, a lot of this cruelty toward animals may be, um, may be ended. And, 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 you know, the other part of that is like, they will be um, ideally growing this kind of meat without the, um, the hormones, the antibiotics, you know, a lot of the, what, the, what, 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 what in the, the meat we get from all animals today causes illness, you know, a, a lot of um, conditions. All right, so, um, so, all right, so, so again, you know, just, um, it's not about just us, it's about the animals. Um, now, all right, so in order to love um, others, oneself, life, you know, because you really want, exp you know, to expand your love toward everything and it's like you know to, to love reality you know to again love is a connection you want to feel really connected with reality so um, so in order to do this especially when it relates to human beings we we need to overcome our fear of others you know I think um, to a great extent even though we're, we're much more civilized and social now than we were, let's say, 500 years ago or 2,000 or 4,000 years ago, you know, when we had uh, fewer language skills, fewer social skills, you know, much less civilization. You know, we still in today's world, uh, especially in cities where, you know, almost everybody you encounter on the street are pretty much anonymous. You may not never see them again. Um, there, we tend to have this, this, this fear of others that it is, it's a throwback from earlier you know, eras of, of human history where we couldn't really trust each other that much. You know, we didn't know friend from foe or just sometimes we couldn't communicate. But the, the idea is like to, to really, you know, love requires, you know, overcoming this fear. Now, again, I, I've said that there, there are 
It's not just about being enlightened. This show isn't just about enlightenment. There are different levels of enlightenment, different ways of being enlightened. For example, I don't think a person can claim to be enlightened without being very happy and also without being a vegan. It, it's really hard to kind of like to eat um, animal flesh, you know, knowing what, what they've gone through and, and, you know, and believe one is enlightened. And so like with, with, this, with this idea of fearing others, you know, I think that's another component. Now, you know, I, I consider myself enlightened to a certain extent, but there are levels of enlightenment. I could be much more enlightened, for example, in um, overcoming my fear of others. You know, we have this, and to the extent we, you know, and I think that, that, that relates to kind of like a trust, a trust that, that, um, that first of all, most people are not going to be um, threats. You know, we tend to have like threats you know, about our ego, that we're going to be offended or insulted or rejected and all that stuff. And um, so, yeah, we, we, we need to overcome that. And, you know, it's just to understand that most people are not going to um, behave in that way. And, and if they do, if there's no kind of like connection for whatever reason, if they, if, you know, you approach somebody and they feel offended for whatever reason, you know, right or wrong, it's not the end of the world. It's no big deal. So, like, but I think we human beings do have this, this fear of each other in that way. It prevents us from like communicating, and when we're prevented from communicating, we're prevented from loving each other as, as much as we could. Okay, um, and in addition to kind of like not feeling afraid of others, this is something else that I've got to work on. You know, um, that you have. You know, it, it's important to have a genuine interest in others. In other words, like to if if you don't know someone, you know, I think that your love towards someone is to a great extent predicated um, on how well you know the person. You know, it, it's, much hard, it's much harder to love a stranger than it is to love somebody that, that you've known for 10, 20 years. You know, sometimes it could be the opposite because, you know, sometimes what we know just works against us. But, but no, it, it, you know, if you really want to, like, cultivate this love toward others, it's important that, that um, that you know them, and so like this is about just showing an interest in others. Again, like in my particular case, I, I, I love people generally, like I generally have positive feelings toward people. Um, you know, when I'm out in the street, I'm smiling toward everybody. I, sometimes I feel like that um, character in Crocodile Dundee, um, I forget what the guy's name is, but he's, he's from Australia, from the outback, where like, you know, you might see somebody every five miles, so he comes into Manhattan. You know, and he's walking the streets trying to like greet everybody, saying good day, whatever. <laughs> so, anyways, sometimes I, I feel like you know that ha I have that kind of connection toward people, but I can certainly work on on this. You know, I've spent so many years, decades, kind of like exploring issues like happiness and this this illusion of free will and economics, and you know how to how to better the world, which are you know noble goals and over noble endeavors. But you know, to a certain extent, it's been at the expense of really having you know, a strong, um, genuine interest in, in other people, what makes people tick and all. Um, again, it, um, to the extent we do that, we, we can, you know, know each other more deeply, more completely, and that allows that connection, that connection of love to happen more, more completely. Okay, um, love requires fairness, you know, like sometimes you're in a relationship and there's a power imbalance. A lot of times this happens when parents are raising kids. It, you know, the parents have all the power, the kids feel powerless, and you know, that interferes with love. I mean, you love, for example, like another instance of this is like you might be with someone who talks all the time, you know, who just like is so self-involved, so loving of themselves that they're not, you know, you know, love requires a certain kind of a balance, a certain kind of fairness. So like when you talk to people, you know, it's just like to show your love toward them. You don't want to just like be talking. You don't want just an audience for, 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 for your thoughts without also allowing the other person to, to, um, to talk as well. That's, you know, again, so like love, love kind of um, mandates a, a, a fairness, a balance, a consideration, you know, of, of, the, of the balance and power in relationships and, and interactions. Um, Okay, again, love is very much, I think a, a very strong synonym of love is um, compassion. You know, basically, um, to love someone, to love people, is to care about them, 
to not, it's not just about wanting them to feel happy, it's also about not wanting them to suffer. So, I mean, you know, the Buddha, if, if the guy ever existed, I don't know, I've been reading about this, and like, you know, it's like the stuff about the Buddha, it was only written several hundred years after he lived, and you know, you don't know what's true or not, whatever. Same with Christianity and Judaism. But, um, but you know, the idea, the, the Buddhist ideals, at least, you know, have to do with, um, with ending suffering. That's what the Four Noble Truths are about. That, like, you know, life contains suffering, sometimes mistranslated, or who knows, <laughs> as, as, love, as, um, as life is suffering. And then, you know, the, the Second Noble Truth is suffering comes from attachment, which is interesting because, like, you know, according to the Buddha, I mean, like, love to a great extent is attachment, you know, but on the other hand, I guess if, it, if it's not a wise kind of attachment, if it's, been a, if it's an attachment that creates a dependency, a codependency, then that can certainly work against, you know, both the person one loves and, and your happiness. So, but, but the Buddha kind of like, you know, kind of like emphasized this, this, this matter of compassion. So it's not just about helping others to feel happy, it's also to recognize so much pain in the world. I, I just um, encountered a, a statistic last night that I was just um, reading, um, I, was, I was reading the wiki um, entry on death, you know, anyway, so like, what I noticed is, is that um, there are about 60 million people that die each year on the planet for, from various causes, and over half of them, about 35 million of these people, die from malnutrition, from, from hunger, from not, not having an adequate diet, you know, not having enough nutrients. And, you know, like, I've worked on global poverty for, for years, for decades before, and I, the, the statistic that I used to quote was that every year, 10 million kids under the age of five die from poverty-related causes like hunger and infectious diseases that could be easily treated. And that amounts to about like 30,000 kids each day, which is like beyond horrible. But, you know, it extends like, you know, it, it, it extends far beyond the kids. You know, um, another, another 20 um, million each year are, are their, their parents and grandparents and also like, you know, I mean like in terms of the world, I mean like you know, this world is so unenlightened that, that so many of us have so much, and because our schools probably don't teach us wisdom, because our, our schools don't teach us how to be happy, how to love, because it's not really in the culture, um, we are just like so unenlightened as, as, a, as a world, you know, like the, those of us who have too much yet, you know, because we don't understand how to be happy, because um, we've never been taught, we keep on seeking happiness by, by wanting more and more. And often this is at the expense of, of others. I mean, like, the rich countries of the world routinely, as, as, a, as, a, as a matter of policy, really, it's, it's implicit, nobody would admit it, but if you look at the, the facts, basically we, we, we keep countries poor throughout the world so we could buy their natural resources at a cheaper rate and so we can buy their labor for less money. So, you know, in terms of the world, this, this, you know, this, this idea about love and enlightenment, it's not just about human beings as individuals, it's also about societies, countries, you know. And um, so we, we really should, um, you know, be much more compassionate toward those of us who have so much less than us. And, um, and it's, it's just wrong. It's just like, it's, it's the antithesis of love. Okay. Um, so, all right. So, like, fine. Um, we are, we're far from, from being as loving as we could be, but like it's not, I'm not saying that we should like, kind of like really, really feel horrible about this. I mean like, I just did um, 216 episodes of a series, television series on free will, how, how like we just don't have a free will, it's not up to us. So yes, fine, we're, we're horrible toward other people, but it's not like we should beat ourselves up over this. We should help them, you know, sometimes if, if if actually suffering guilt will motivate us to, to help them, I, I would, even though it's not really our fault fundamentally, we don't have a free will, I would recommend that. You know, go through a bit of pain to kind of like cultivate that compassion and that empathy, and then, um, and then you know, gradually like, you know, um, minimize that, that negative feeling as you feel you're, you're doing enough. 
Okay, um, so we only have about two and a half minutes left, so let me go a few more thoughts. A lot of times love is about seeing the good in everyone. I mean, we are so imperfect, and it's not, you know, we don't have a free will, it's not up, up to us. And, um, but we have a lot of good, you know, fine. I just like mentioned um, that over half of the people who die every year, you know, 35 million die of hunger and nutritional deficiencies and all. But, you know, on the other hand, 200 years ago, for example, almost the, the entire world was poor. You know, um, right now, you know, one to two billion of our 7.5 billion uh, people population are, are poor, you know, lack safe drinking water and, and food and all. But on the other hand, we've, you know, we've, we've worked really hard, we've done a lot of good so that uh, many of us have been spared that. It's not, now we just have to like, just understand that it's not just about us, it's about all of us. Okay, so, um, and I guess I wanna, all right, just briefly, there, there's a, you know, in order to cultivate um, love, there's actually meditation in Buddhism where you start with, for example, loving yourself. You know, you just like you send love to yourself and then you send love to the people closest to you. Then you send love to your acquaintances, your co-workers, you know, and then, then you send love to people who you don't know and then you send love to your enemies, you know, so it kind of like cultivates this idea of kind of like sending love to people as a way of connecting with them, of, of feeling good about them and wanting good toward them. And so that, that's a good practice, you know, that's something we can do daily to, to cultivate this. And, and lastly, you know, I think even though, you know, when, when people are asked, like, what makes them the happiest, they say that other people are their number one source of happiness. We really should, though, see other people not as so much a source of, of happiness, but as sources um, to do good. In other words, like opportunities to do good. When we, when we look at people that way, then, you know, that puts us in the perspective, what can I do to help this person? And if everybody feels this way, we'd create a much better world. All right, that's all we have time for today. Uh, thanks for watching. We will see you next week. Thanks.